It has been uh, two weeks since I've seen you last. I trust you have been well fed uh, Sunday by Sunday, but also day by day uh, in your own devotions. I was, uh, and I mentioned this to the, the prayer meeting on the group of those who are praying on Wednesday, hard pressed to know which way to go in terms of where we are now. We have two options before us. One, to continue in the three or so weeks that we've been looking at the return of Christ. What's next? First Thessalonians doesn't do all the other questions we may have about the return of Christ. Second Thessalonians chapter 2 does, and 1 John chapter 4 does, and Revelation 20, 21, and 22 does, and some of Daniel does. And so I was uh, working on two sermons this week. Lord, which way do we go? However, I have felt strongly for various reasons, two reasons, in fact, that we should stay in the passage and possibly after this, with uh, the other elders' agreement and working together, begin Second Thessalonians right after this. And so, friends, we come to the next section. You're in verse 12. You've ended chapter 4, the coming of the Lord, chapter 5, the day of the Lord. And now we continue, and if you have questions about the return of Christ, please press pause or shoot those to me individually um, on WhatsApp or however you want to do that. We come to the next section, which deals with, I think, a very important section. In fact, it is because of the section coming up that I was like, okay, we've got to do this. <laughs> as much as I'm tempted to do the rest of the return of Christ, we've got to go here. You might say, well, wh why? Please do have a look. First Thessalonians chapter 5, verse 12 and 13. We are just looking at those two verses this morning and possibly next week as well. We ask you, brothers, to respect those who labor among you and are over you in the Lord and admonish you and to esteem them very highly in love because of their work. Be at peace among yourselves. I want to link that one sentence, verse 12 and 13, with that closing sentence, be at peace among yourselves in this way. I think when you have bad leaders, you're not at peace. When you have good leaders, may the peace of Christ be among you. Be at peace among yourselves. And so what we're talking about is leadership. And you know in this country, and I suspect across the world, we seem to have more than our fair share in Africa and South Africa of what seem to be really, really bad leaders in the church. I say that uh, mindful of what I'm talking about. If, if you've had a look around, you will notice there are some very weird and wacky forms of leadership in a church, even abusive leadership. And therefore, it does not surprise me to find a lack of peace in those churches. Just two weeks ago, I had a student speak to me about the difficulty he is having in his church with the elders of his church. And I said to him, you've got two choices. One, you're required to go and speak to them, to put it before them. And two, if on biblical grounds they will not listen, you are required to leave. Because this passage says that we are to be at peace among ourselves. Are there biblical reasons to leave a church? I believe there are. I believe there are definitely reasons where enough is enough and you've been honest and put your cards on the table and so this morning we are talking about church leadership but it's set in a particular way how should we be led or if you like 
what should my attitude be to spiritual leadership? That is, it's not talking primarily to leaders. It does implicitly. But it talks explicitly to those who are being led. What is your attitude? This prompts a number of issues for me because I've seen and experienced personally bad leadership and bad attitudes to what I think is bad leadership in myself. And so this passage is for me. But it is also for you as a church. There are times where I get to preach on passages that I would rather not preach. And this is one of those where Jesus says this to his church, but I'd much rather not be the one saying it to you directly because it implies, you know, applies to me in terms of what is your attitude to me and to Graham as elders? Where are you at? You will know today we are at a church meeting and we will decide if Colin agrees for Colin's name to come to you also as an elder. And again, the question, what is your attitude to a new elder? Scripture tells us very clearly, and I thank God for this, he doesn't leave us in the dark about all sorts of questions in the church and individually. He directs us with the light of his word, his lamp, his light going before us. And so this passage, I think, is really, really wonderful to look at. I have notes. I think I'm intentionally going to leave it closed because I want to speak from the heart. And sometimes the notes get in the way. It's a sad thing. What is your attitude to leaders? I have now been a pastor for uh, 22, three years. And my wife has been a pastor's wife for 23 years. And we have seen all sorts of attitudes in the church. And a lot of this I could draw out of my experience. That's not where we go, or to go primarily. What does God tell us to do? And so, friends, firstly, please have a look. Who are those who labor among us? That's the big question, I think. If we are to have a particular attitude to those who labor among us, and I know that's a lot of text. Let's work through it one by one. We ask you, brothers, to respect those who labor among you. Who are those? And particularly in congregational churches, the question of who leads the church is a good one and a necessary one to ask and to answer. Who leads the church? This little phrase I have borrowed out of the 2017 Statement of Belief because I think it is particularly helpful. Who leads the church? Each local church is ruled by Jesus Christ, governed by its members, led by its shepherds, and served by its deacons. I think that's really helpful. It is ruled by Christ. Therefore, if a leader says one thing and Christ says another, you know this is not Christ telling the leader to do this. It's the leader telling the church, this is where we're going to go, instead of a following of Christ. It's very often thought that in marriage, a husband is the head of the home and can do whatever he likes. That is not true. In the same way as elders are not the head of the church and can do whatever they like. Husbands are to come under the authority of Christ, to love your wife as Christ loves the church. So two elders are to come under the authority of Christ and are led by Christ. How are we to lead like this? This is how we are to lead. This is how we are to point the direction. We'll talk about some of the things involved in leadership. This is what we are to do. And very often, you will know in congregational churches, and Baptist churches are no exception. Sometimes there is a difficulty between who leads between elders and uh, the members of a local church. This should not be that the two are offset against one another. But from time to time it happens. I've seen it happen. I've experienced it happening. It is not pleasant. And thus we are to be led by Christ, by his word, by his spirit as a church. 
But you will know there are some decisions that we need to make where the elders feel strongly we are to go this way and the members feel strongly we should not go this way, we should go this way. What happens then? I want to commend to you 1 Thessalonians chapter 5, verse 12 in that context. We ask you, brothers, to respect those who labor among you and are over you in the Lord. That does not mean a complete submission to whatever they want and, and needs to be done in their view. It needs to be by his word, by his spirit. And the congregation ought to sense that and pray for that and to follow, ideally, their shepherds. But the elders also are to lead with the help of deacons. Please turn with me to 1 Timothy chapter 5. We're going to look at a bunch of passages. Because I want to, from those two verses, see how this fits with so many other New Testament passages particularly. 1 Timothy 5 verse 17 Let the elders who rule well be considered worthy of double honor, especially those who labor in preaching and teaching. Let the elders who rule well, the Greek word for this word simply means to rule. The English is right in its translation. Let the elders who rule well, meaning that there could be elders who do not rule well. It opens the door to that possibility. It could also mean that there are elders who rule well in labor and labor in preaching and teaching and elders who rule well and don't labor in preaching and teaching. You with me? So, so the point is elders are to rule well. And when they do, they are to be recognized in terms of this honor. Please have a look at Ephesians chapter 4, verse 11. We started here this morning. I didn't read down to verse 11, but certainly the call to worship was from Ephesians chapter 4. And here you will see, if this is one Lord, one faith, one baptism, one God and Father of all who is over all and through all and in all, and that needs some unpacking for another day, that little phrase, over all and through all and in all, is a wonderful phrase. Come down to verse um, 11. He, he, Christ, he, Christ, gave the apostles, the pastors, ach, the prophets, the evangelists and pastors and teachers to equip the saints for the work of ministry, for building up the body of Christ until we all attain to the unity of the faith and of the knowledge of the Son of God to mature manhood to the measure of the stature of the fullness of Christ, so that we will no longer be tossed, no longer be children tossed to and fro by the waves and carried about by every wind of doctrine. That is, the point of these gifted men is so that they may assist the congregation to grow up into full maturity, to look like Jesus in character. But notice who gives them. That is, Christ gives them. And you might say, well, hang on a second, a congregational church, we gave them. Well, that's not entirely true. You were the means that God used to give elders and deacons to the church. You were the means. But God gives and he uses you in the process. It's a wonderful thing. And you can rack your brain in terms of working out how that works. But that's how it works. Acts 20, come with me. I want you to see here, and I'm going to be brief, that the elders and the deacons are the two officers in the church, and their, their tasks are distinct. Elders are to lead, assisted by the deacons who serve. 
and the two work hand in hand. Thus, deacons assist the elders, and the elders assist the deacons. Those two things work really closely. Acts 20, verse 17. From Miletus, he called to Ephesus, sent to Ephesus and, Ephesus and called the elders of the church to come to him. And, he, and when they came, he said to them, you yourselves know. So he's calling the elders. Come down to verse 28. Here is what he says to them, part of it. Pay careful attention to yourselves and to all the flock in which the Holy Spirit has made you overseers. Hmm. The Holy Spirit. Christ. The Holy Spirit did it. Through the congregation, right? Through the laying on of hands in this case and the appointing of elders in every city. But notice, too, the synonyms used for the word elders. Pay careful attention to yourselves and to all the flock in which the Holy Spirit has made you overseers. You are to see over, to care for the church of God, which he obtained with his own blood. Pastor, bishop, elder, overseer, same, same role, different title. One who shepherds, one who looks after and cares for sheep. He has a spiritual and a practical responsibility. It's not just spiritual. It's both. But that is different to the task of deacons. And we see that particularly in 1 Timothy 3. And I've simply put the references up there where you see elders are to do this, be this type of person, and deacons are this type of person. And you try and spot the differences between the list. The only difference is elders are able to teach. That is, their primary task is to equip the body in, in this, that which I'm doing right now, preaching and teaching. Deacons are to assist that process with all the practical aspects that go with being a body of Christ. Thank you so much. To each of you who have served us so well already, did you notice when you came in the chairs were already in lines? When we left here on Friday, it wasn't like that. <laughs> Somebody somewhere did something. The doors are open. You have air. The lights are on. The electricity bill, I trust, is being paid. All of these things happen behind the scenes and you hardly even know they're happening. But these are taken care of very quietly by people who serve in a deacon capacity, some of them officially as deacons, many of them with no recognition whatsoever. And in fact, some of them rejoice in that. No, no, don't appoint me as deacon. I just want to serve Christ practically. So please notice different, different tasks, different offices, elder and deacon. Who are those who labor among you? Come with me back to 1 Thessalonians chapter 5. I hope I've answered the question. It is those who are elders and deacons. They serve among you. Now we ask you, brothers, we ask you, brothers, here's Paul speaking to the church in Thessaloniki after three or four weeks of being with them. We ask you, brothers, to respect those who labor among you and are over you. Hmm. What should my attitude be? Number one, respect. Respect. And I've put some other words up there for what do we mean when we're talking about respect. Please don't think I'm preaching me. This is what God tells us as a church to do for all of our leaders. Respect, admire, have a high regard for, appreciate and honor. But notice firstly, in the drop down there, labor among you. They are to labor among you before they are shown as over you. It's fascinating. If they are not laboring among you, I'm not sure they should be put over you. Does that make sense? And, and notice the order. We ask you, brothers, to respect those who labor among you and are over you in the Lord. See, see the order? 
I always say we don't appoint deacons or elders into positions. We recognize them into positions. <laughs> See the difference? Because they're already working. They are among you. Paul has that as a list of requirements of elders. Verse 18, I was with you in your homes, among you. You guys, you got, you got to be among the flock. Because it's very easy for somebody to stand in front of you or to serve you in practical ways and they have a lifestyle that is private. Don't listen and follow what they say. So how do you know whether their character is authentic? They're among you. You can have fat conversations with them and sit down for tea and coffee and all the stuff that we are to do as brothers and sisters together. They are meant to be among you before they are recognized as over you. Very interesting order. Secondly, please notice that they are to labor. You don't appoint into positions those who think it's all about the position and about the power trip. And sadly, some of our leaders seem to think it's about the title or about the position and the, the honor you need to give me. You want to hear from your leaders a delight in the title, Servant of the Most High God, full stop. Yes, I'm called Pastor Lance. Yes, that pastor means I am to shepherd, pastoral, I'm to be among the flock. But I, I don't rejoice in that title. In fact, I chafe under it sometimes. Because I, I simply want to serve God among you and to help you grow and to be shaped into the image of Christ as I long to be. Yet, they are appointed over you. They're not just among you. But they're not to be bossy. They're not to come in and say, you listen to me or else. In fact, please do turn to Luke 22. Jesus gives us a wonderful, wonderful teaching of how those who aspire to greatness ought to serve. Luke 22, 25. He said to them, the kings of the Gentiles exercise lordship over you. And those in authority over them are called benefactors, but not so with you, disciples. You want to you follow me? Rather, let the greatest among you become as the youngest and the leader as one who serves. For whoever is the greater... The greater one who, who reclines at table or one who serves. Is it not the one who reclines at table? But I am among you as the one who serves. Deacons and elders, hear me now. Aim down. Aim down. Aim down. Don't aim up. Aim down in serving. Aim down. Jesus Aim down, we follow him. If, you, if you're aiming up, you're not following Christ in this life. They are over you, but they are also to admonish you. Friends, 1 Thessalonians 5.14 picks up the admonish, and I'm going to leave that for a future date. I'll come to that. But they are to admonish. This is part of the difficulty you're to do it like this. You're not to do it like this. <laughs> Ever thought about that? You're to, you're to, to, to serve Christ like this. You're serving Christ like this. You're not to serve Christ like this. <laughs> and that's hard because that's honest conversation, right? We're going to get there. They do three things. And therefore respect them if they labor, labor among you like this. Among you, over you, and they admonish you. By the way, pray for me. That last one is the hardest for me. 
Number two, esteem them highly because of their work. Please notice that you are to respect those who labor among you, in verse 13, and to esteem them very highly in love because of their work. Labor, in verse 12, and work, in verse 13. There is a linkage between what they do and the honor they receive, or the recognition, or the esteem, the appreciation. That is, those who do not work well are, and you know this from human behavior, not esteemed. It, it, it's true, right? But for those who do, you are to esteem them. Hmm. Please do not think that means for a moment that we seek that esteem. Elders are not to seek esteem. My reward is in heaven. The more you give me, the less of that reward there is accumulated. <laughs> that's the way I see it. How can I serve you? Because that's who I, how I receive a reward in, in that age. And so aim down. But scripture says that you ought to esteem them because of their work. But you're to do that in a very particular way. You are to esteem them with love. And I've simply broken this into a separate point. You are to love them because of their work. Friends, it is true that sometimes leadership is a very lonely place. If you serve or served in leadership, you will know it can be the most lonely place. And then, you, you, it might surprise you to know that these are human beings. That they're wired just the way you are, with all their foibles and, and loves. They're just like you. One of the things that I appreciate are these words. Pastor, thank you for your service today among us. But I follow them up with these words. Every good and perfect gift comes from the Father above, right? It's not about me. It's about God who gives gifts. But we ought to appreciate the one who's received the gift. And we're to love them. We're to esteem them with love. That's what the passage says. Do not think for a moment that I'm preaching this, or preaching Graham or Colin as elders or dares, other deacons, that we are preaching this simply to say, hey guys, notch up your esteem. We don't feel loved right now. <laughs> it's not what we're saying. We're saying there ought to be very particular distinctive attitudes in the body of Christ for those who are among you as elders and deacons. It looks like this. Can you name them? Can you list them? Number one, Respect. Number two, esteem. Number three, love. I want to say thank you for the few months we have been here in which the way we have felt loved and appreciated. It has been such a joy. You know who you are. Excuse me, here I'm crying. <laughs> you know who you are. It has been such a joy to serve with you. It's meant to be like this. Why? Because this is how Peace comes among you. Let me close by taking you to a passage in Hebrews. A well-known passage. It's certainly one of my, my go-to passages on leadership. Hebrews 13. You'll find the word leader only twice in the whole letter. Both of them appear in the last chapter. And let me take you to both. Hebrews 13 verse 7. Remember your leaders, those who spoke to you the word of God. Consider the outcome of their way of life. They're among you, right? You can see and imitate their faith. Come down to verse 17. Obey your leaders and submit to them. Why? For they are keeping watch over your souls as 
those who will have to give an account. We will stand before Christ as elders and give an account for the members of this church. Every one of you. It isn't just a now thing, it's a then thing too. Every one of you. How did you shepherd my sheep, elders? Deacons, how did you serve my flock? Let them do this with joy and not with groaning. I've seen both. I've known both. Let them do this with joy and not with groaning, for that would be of no advantage to you. The knock-on effect of peace among you and the joy is you get the benefit. You get the knock-on effect of, hey man, guys, it's so great serving with you. It's, it's so wonderful what God has done just in, in bringing this family together. And we're not perfect, right? Look around. <laughs> but God is perfecting us. And he does that individually and as I prayed, collectively. Or you can make this really hard. Let me touch on very briefly, and I'm done. The negative attitude that sometimes is in a church. Those elders... Why does he always? I hate the way he. You know how it goes. And then it, it comes to my ears. Brothers and sisters, let them do this with joy and not with groaning. For this would be of no advantage to you if it's with groaning. If it's with joy, it's going to be a great advantage to you. What should our attitude be? Respect, esteem, love, but also joy. I hope you realize this is a temporary thing. The honor elders and deacons in heaven. The job's over. The titles are gone. And every title is laid to Christ. And we will have great joy in that day. With all the shepherds, all the sheep, all the deacons perfected in the image of Christ. Bow with me. Father, here is, here is those whom you have given to the Son. Those who have come to faith in G you, Jesus Christ, because of the work of your Holy Spirit. And those Christ, whom you've given to us as elders to shepherd and look after and care for, to feed, to watch over, to pray for, protect. I ask you, O oh God, to help us as elders that this may be a great joy. I ask you, O oh Lord, for these deacons that they may continue to serve you well. I know how much it's cost. May it be a great joy. But I lastly want to close for us individuals as Christians in our attitude to leadership. Oh God, I pray that you would give us the same attitude to you as our leader, that we might have that attitude to our human leaders as well. In your name we pray. Amen.